there will be this meeting of the RAP C um, for the purposes of maintaining correct. I can see that the chair is here, John Tomlinson, thank you. I can see that Luanne Grujon is here, thank you. Um, can I confirm Councillor Bell? Oh, I can now see Councillor Bell. That's fine. Thank oh, you very much. <laughs> Councillor Cook? Yep, I'm back. That's fine. And we've got Alex here as well as the lead officer. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, uh, Derek. Um, over to you, Anne, please. Uh, contract register commissioning annual reports, if you can introduce this to us. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, that's it's that's fine. Thank you very much. I suppose um first thing I need to point out is this this report was I think has been was postponed from last year because of the, the COVID response. So it, it's good to be able to bring a, an update to the committee today. And what I've tried to do in the report is offer you an update about of the commissioning activity that has taken place um over this past year and our plans of for this year coming. Um I've also uh, provided information for you about the arrangements that we have now for a strategic commissioning and procurement board <clears throat> and the fact that that board is creating a, a work plan which um, which will tie in all of our commissioning activities, our grant funded activities, our market engagement activities and it also um, will ensure that uh, that we are aligned to the governance arrangements within the organisation so that we will be reporting in a, in a, a timely fashion. I've also started try to um, try to, to put in the report some of the examples of market engagement that have taken place over this past year. This has been critically important um, when we think about the difficulties that some of our social care colleagues have had um, during their COVID response, in particular our, our care homes and non-residential sector. Um, I And also um, our plans for the creation of a strategic uh, means or a means of having strategic engagement with, uh, with providers going forwards with our strategic forum, the first meeting of which is on Monday next week, and it's really aimed at, at owners of businesses, chief execs, uh, managing directors and what have you. So it's really trying to get into the nuts and bolts of aligning our strategic thinking. And it's particularly particularly timely as, we, um, as we're starting to pull together our strategic plan for the next however many years. I think just to um, reassure or assure the, the committee that uh, at the moment, our commissioning activities on track. I don't think there have been many reports coming to the IJB over this last year, if at all any, asking for contract extensions. That is our mm -hmm. aim. That we don't, we we try not, wherever possible, to to ask for contract extensions because we haven't had the time to do a, a worthwhile and and thorough review of the services and commissioned accordingly. Um. I think I need to point out that there's a, a significant amount of work that's planned for the rest of this year. So we would hope to be in the same situation, but can't guarantee that. I think if we were going to come back, what we would be asking to do was, would be to come back with some sort of a transitional plan rather than just asking for an extension because we haven't had time to do the work. Um, the other thing is the, the work plan, it is in draft format still. Um, I'm hoping that it's approved at our um, our Strategic Commissioning and Procurement Board on the 30th of June this year. I wouldn't anticipate that I would share the plan with, with committee members, but there would be an opportunity perhaps to do a, a, a create a, a, an overarching summary um, so that committee members can see uh, the work that we have planned for the rest of the year in more detail, if that would be of value. I think that's everything that I needed to say. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. Um, so open that up for questions and comments, please. OK. Um, Luanne? Thanks, John. Um, thanks, Anne. Really impressive to see the, the work that's that's already happened and also the, the plans for this year. I suppose my, my reflection on, on our experiences is really around how we communicate our intent to the public. So not just the service users that are currently using services, but actually 
our approach to how we want things to be in the future. Um, and, I, and I totally understand that's probably quite complex, but in a way, my ask would be that how can we simplify our message so that we get that out in a consistent way to the public so that um, people are with us on the front foot and, and kind of understanding the changes and are, you know, not, um, yeah, not feeling that it's changes that have been done to them, but understand the, the, the thinking behind changes and um, are able to get involved if they want to. Um, so, but I, I think the learning is it's not just about existing service users, it's actually about wider public people who may need our services in the future. So there, there seems to me important communication to be done there, um, I would say. Um, yeah, and it is, it is difficult, I think, um, but uh, as you may be aware, our ambition is to create a market position statement. It's something that we've we've not really we've we've tried it with um, stay well, stay connected. So I suppose that that would be our opportunity, you know, if, if for the public if they if they so wanted to to have a look at what our our strategic intent was and and how we then would go on and 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 commission services. One of the difficulties at the moment is obviously there's still a lot of consultation that's ongoing around the strategic plan so we haven't been able to start on the market position statement it's a little bit like a chicken and egg we need to understand what the public is the, the consultation around the strategic plan is a good way of informing giving us information about say for example um you know our our mental health and learning disability residential uh, work that we're, we're trying to do just now if we're consulting with the public about what their ambitions are, about where they want to live for the future, what their aspirations for the future are, then we need to take that into our commissioning consideration. We've already had discussions about that. Um, and I suppose then including that in our market position statement so that people see that message relayed back to them in the context of our ambitions around commissioning. Um, John, can I just come back if that's... Yes, of course. Um, I, yeah, I, it makes sense to me that it's tied in with the strategic planning, and, and but but I think I, I, I'm not, I like the market position statement that we've got for stay well, stay connected, but it's it's appropriately provider focused. I suppose I'm thinking about you know somebody like my dad. He just wants to know how things how things will affect him, what what care he's going to be able to get, and what how that might be different from what was in the past. And he'll not read a market position statement. You know what I mean? Like so, that if, I wonder. If maybe it's at the end of the the strategic plan that there's some kind of really clear comms plan for for the public about just what they can expect in the future, um, including in that I suppose the the some of the the digital stuff that we've we've touched on. Um, we, we, that's just my my. I always think of my dad <laughs> when I think of how we communicate. Yeah. The other thing that we're doing is we're working very close. Well, we've, we've been we've been working closely with Scottish Care, who have designed or they have access to a means of um, creating animated stories. So, um, what I I was able to see yesterday for the first time, an animated story that they they've created around our enabling approach. So, and it's really nice. It's it's sort of it's an animation of somebody who's had a stroke. And they'd sort of take people through that recovery and then um it, it offers reassurance to the public as well because it, you know it it's sort of part of the animation is about you know their their uh, social worker having a conversation with them and perhaps their family about what their aspirations are and how they then connect into community resources so that's so so there are opportunities Luan, to do things like that uh, you know uh, around our widest thing so so some of the work that we would be doing if there is a significant change we you know this is the first time that we've tried this with Scottish Care but it's as much for our staff as it is for and for carers the other thing that they're doing I've seen now is that they're doing something similar around this for our own staff around an enabling approach so uh, taking they've created a storyboard where you know people have managed to access different pieces of equipment in the in the different rooms of their house to allow them to continue to be as independent as they possibly can. So I suppose there, there are different opportunities. And yes, we, I suppose if we get a collection of those or a library of those, then maybe those links could be incorporated, perhaps, I don't know, Alison's on the call, in our strategic plan so they can start, so people can click on the link and see those animations as well. They're really nice and very short as well. Okay, thanks. Um, 
I don't know if Alison, whether you wanted to come in on that or not. Um, I'm just going to make a suggestion. We've, we've got a theme that's come through a number of the reports, which is around um, public um, uh, communication. And I, I would extend that into being um, taking the public with us um, in, in on this journey. And perhaps we are reaching a point where you know, we can dust off what, what the story is and, and, and how that messaging can, can be looked at. Maybe for this committee and, and this um, lens on it, we can reflect on that when we get to the strategic risk register, you know, in terms of what, whether there's a risk in, in you know, not having the public coming on that journey, etc. And that's just a suggestion. We can maybe reflect on that at that point. But Alison, did you want to offer any comment at this stage? Yeah, we've we've actually uh, or we've we've been having some ideas about um, how we communicate our strategic plan to the the um, public at large. Um, so we're thinking uh, we'll have the strategic plan, but we'll also have um, a kind of easy read version and perhaps even a kind of animated launch of that. So what Anne's talking about would would. Um, dovetail in very well to, to to that so that we can have um key messages that that are easy for 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 the public to access without them having to read the the full st uh, strategic plan the, the other thing and i suppose I, um Often. which i haven't included in the report this is part of the stay well stay connected uh, i suppose that the whole change in approach Goes spans across quite a lot of the of the uh, commissioning activity. So, so Jane Boyle from Alison's team is also working on on an agile booklet. And I, I'm sorry, but I can't remember. Agile is an acronym. It's about Aberdeen, then something, and and that is really almost like a self help document. So it, it you know, and it's about enabling you to to do X, Y, and Z. And it's it's got links to different uh, pieces of information as well. And so as people are as we're speaking to people about uh, receiving care, say for example, then they could have access to the Agile booklet. So they could actually, it, it gives them more information. So it's actually about helping them to see what else that they can do for themselves or for families, you know, what else is available. You know, it's got things in there about heating, you know, just the very broadest sense. So I suppose that in itself also will help the public. It, it's equipping the public almost to be able to start to think about how do I help myself to a degree within this or where do I get links to different information so I suppose that's the thing with with the commissioning work that we've been doing it's not it is it's quite broad it's not it's not just around you know the the contractual element of it which I think is probably where it needs to sit so it's trying to think about how do we how do we help the public and ease the public into the different ways that we're working appreciating that it's it's new um, it's new for our staff, it's new for us, it's very much new for, and if you're coming into care, you know, from the start, then that's, that's a conversation in itself, but if you've been used to receiving care in a particular way for several years, how do we help you to see that this isn't about us withdrawing care, but it's about us trying to work with you to see how we meet your outcomes. Okay, thanks. And I'm noting that the the workshop on the strategy on the 21st of September sort of touches around co-production, etc. So maybe you can just take away from uh, from today an interest around um, IJB members um, to to understand the messaging part. And maybe that's an opportunity to have a discussion around that. Then, um, okay. Don't see anybody else signalling for for questions on this. Um, I think uh, we. I don't have anything specific, but did want to acknowledge um, what uh, has been touched on, which is the work that's gone in behind this. Again, through a, a difficult period, we've been navigating uh, change, um, and and that's um, had its ups and downs a wee bit. But the fact is, we're in this position now because we have a take or you know. Uh, you and your team and, and those colleagues around you have taken this forward. So I think as a committee, we'd want to acknowledge that um, and, and the future work programme. You asked about um, sharing that. I think that would be welcome, um, 
and if you could um, just distribute that to to the members um, and probably for, for, for the whole IJB rather than just just this committee but obviously we can only speak for, for this committee um, so that, that would be welcome um, so we've got on page 53 the recommendations um, and is to note the content of the annual review and Derek if you can add the, an acknowledgement uh, on progress and, and future plans to that um, I'd like you to do that on behalf of the committee. OK, so thank you very much, Shan. Um, if we can move on to item nine, page 59, which is the uh, strategic risk, risk register. And Martin, are you with us? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks, you Chair. Thank you. Yeah, so the report presents the committee with the latest version of the IJB's strategic risk register. I'll just outline some of the, the major kind of changes since the last time the committee considered it. So the risk on exiting the EU has been removed from the register and a new strategic risk has been added um, to reflect the inclusion of IJBs as ca category one responders under the Civil Contingency Act. So both of those decisions were made by the IJB last month. Um, the IJB also last month um, asked that the strate strategic risk be reviewed and edited to make the risks as up to date as possible. Um, ahead of the, the planned IGB workshop to be held in October. So at that workshop, members of the board will review both the risk appetite statement as well as the risks. Um, so the editing of the risks will be undertaken over the summer period ahead of the workshop. Um, specifically in relation to strategic risk three, which is the host of services, um, the committee in January agreed that a review on this risk could be brought back to the committee to look at both the services hosted by the City IJB as well as those services being hosted by Aberdeenshire and Murray IJBs. So this review will be reported to the committee in, at its next meeting in September. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on the report um, and some of the risk owners are, are in the uh, in the meeting just now if they have any, if the committee have any specific um, comments on any of those risks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Martin, and we'll open that up. We have done quite a lot on risk and we're going to have a, a, a particular deep dive into it uh, next time. So, um, but we'll, we'll see if there are any um, comments for today. Um, I'm not seeing anybody signalling um, and I'll, I'll Councillor Bell, I'll bring you in just now. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we, we, we've had the, uh, the, the audited accounts presented to us uh, earlier, um, and I'm wondering though if risk two, um, risk of financial failure uh, that demand outstrips budget um, is very is shown as very high. Is that still the case, do we think, as opposed to maybe high? I mean, they, these risks can go up and down, can't they? But for the moment, I mean, all, all seems to be reasonably well, doesn't it? Perhaps Alex, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think um, I think that one can come down, Councillor Bell. Um, but I was just waiting until I get the quarter one results before doing so. So, so once I get the quarter one results, I would just anticipate that the next time you see this, that that will have come down as a result of the things that you've outlined there. Uh, but as I say, at the moment, just taking a, a little bit of a cautious approach to see what happens in quarter one. Of course, being a good accountant, that's what I would expect, Alex. Thank you. Yes. And, uh, and Councillor Bell, your uh, scrutiny of this is always very welcome. You've uh, become an expert on our risk register, I think. Yes, but that wasn't a tongue in cheek comment, was it, by any chance? Or uh, no, Not of course. No, no, no. It's right. a genuine uh, comment. <laughs> yeah. hey, thanks. Um, so, any other comments on this? The only one I'll, I'll just raise is is that one around the the public and whether in due course. I don't think we want to pursue it today, but we can maybe ask uh, Martin and colleagues just to reflect on that as to whether um, if we are not starting to communicate or, or take that aspect forward um, thoroughly enough, whether that becomes a, a risk in terms of, of, of us achieving our aims. And I know there's a lot of good work around the um, locality work, but it's possibly that uh, and a broader picture around it. So would that be an ask that we can make, uh, Martin, mm -hmm. just to reflect on that? 
Yeah, I think it'd be helpful to have that minuted. Um, we can take it through the leadership team business meetings. We've set these up for six weekly um, meetings. So, um, and the strategic risks are considered at those meetings. So I can bring it to the next meeting of that group to, to highlight what the, the, the committee are, are suggesting. And then I, I would propose that maybe that could form part of the, the review and, and edit of the of the uh, the risk register um, and have something hopefully to put in front of the, the workshop in October. OK, that, that's fine. And then as long as that is taken as, a, as, an, as an ask to consider whether it's appropriate here or, or what can be done, as opposed to an expectation that it, it appears, because um, I think it's at that earlier stage. Is that, that fair? Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm happy with that, Chair. OK, thank you very much. And, and Derek, would you pick that up as within the um, recommendations? Yes, Chair, when you get to it, I mean, we only have the one recommendation at the moment, but I wouldn't consider including another one that the Chief Finance Officer gives consideration to the inclusion of a public awareness campaign from discussions present at today's meeting, or you could include it in your confirmation of assurance at the end, whatever suits yourself, Chair. Um, OK, I think it could be included here, and maybe your wording it would just be the appropriateness or not of yes. including that, um, just to make it uh, at that early stage of consideration. Um, OK, so I don't see anybody else signalling on this. I know it's a big report, but it is in the context of having done quite a lot on this in, in the recent months and having a, uh, a deep look at it next time round. Um, so I appreciate the various um, leads coming today and uh, so it's certainly not a lack of interest in this that we uh, we're not taking a lot of time over it today. Um, so can we go to that recommendation that we note the revised um, strategic risk register as as Martin has explained and add that second recommendation uh, to to look at the appropriateness of of including anything around the um, public. OK. Yes, agreed. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Martin. If we can go through now to the, the last substantive item, but it's a significant item, so it's certainly not um, uh, the least important being last here. It's a very important one for us. And Callum, uh, we have you here. Do you have anybody else with you? Yes, I've uh, brought along with me Duncan Sage, who is a principal analyst with Public Health Scotland, who's been um, collaborating on this piece of work with me and the team. OK, uh, welcome uh, to the committee, Duncan. Um, thank, thank you, you very for, much. Thank you for attending today. So, um, Callum, um, it's a significant stage that you've reached with uh, producing this evaluation report. I'll hand over to you in a moment uh, to introduce this. And if did you have anything that you wanted to do as a presentation, or will you just speak to it, or what? Um, well, yes. Uh, given the, the 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 scale and breadth of the report, then I had prepared a very short, maybe just slightly over the five minutes presentation, which really, I suppose, rather than going through the findings in, in a lot of detail which are available in the report is really more of a story, I suppose, about the journey that we've gone on in terms of um, where we were at, where we're at now and what that might look like moving forward. So um, if you were agreeable to that, I would happily uh, share my slide and talk the, talk the committee through that. Certainly, that would be very helpful. Thank you. OK, super. So I, I will um, I'll share my slides and I'll chat through it and then uh, happy to take any questions or comments uh, at the end. Um, and before I uh, begin this presentation, I would like to uh, acknowledge the, the, the co-authors on the screen um, from Public Health Scotland and NHS Grampian, who have been uh, pivotal in the development of uh, this piece of evaluation that the board have uh, in front of them. So this is just a little bit of a reminder at a high level as to the, the purpose of this report. It's really to evidence the impact of the Operation Home First portfolio. Um, the committee will be very well versed as to what are the what are the aims of Home First, and they will also be well versed to the priorities um, highlighted in orange, which are relevant to Aberdeen City. 
There have been a variety of additional questions that uh, as an evaluation working group, we've been asked along the way and um, questions around the impact at a population level, cost, health inequalities, etc. We have aimed uh, to do our best to address these in a pragmatic way within the report. However, it's important to um, remember that the primary function was really about understanding the cumulative impact of each of the Home First priorities against the aims of Home First. Again, I'm not going to go through this slide in any detail either. This is also uh, something that the report that the committee have seen previously, but it's just to reiterate that um, as a evaluation working group, we developed and applied a consistent methodology across all of the home first priorities. So this helped us really understand whether they were ultimately feasible to implement, help us understand the types of outcomes that we could expect them to deliver and then ultimately developing a performance dashboard, which helps us monitor the progress of these priorities as they develop over time. The one key thing, however, that I did want to really emphasize here is that a complex por portfolio such as Operation Home First will always generate complex answers. And this is a very, very conceptual slide, and we uh, colloquially call it the nasty graph in the evaluation working group, but it really, is an attempt to try and show uh, just how difficult this is and how anything as big and complex as this you're never going to be able to actually boil it down to a single figure or, or a single dollar sign if you like and there are a variety of reasons for this some of which are captured on the slide so we have different priorities which are projects or a group of projects i.e a program we have initiatives that uh, deliver against one two or in some cases three of the aims of Home First. We have some initiatives that are small scale tests of change. We have some which are occurring at a population level and we have some that are focused more on the upstream self management agenda and others that are more focused on downstream acute settings. And all of this is notwithstanding the fact that many of these priorities are actually interlinked and interrelated. So this is a really, really important context, um, I think, when we're trying to actually understand the totality of this of this portfolio and I think this is really the one kind of key take home message that I want the, the committee to consider. So really I think what this process is showing is that what we can do is actually apply the concept of evaluation beyond where we would typically apply it which is at the end of, 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 a, of a project to see whether it's worked or not. And actually really what we can do is embed it throughout the strategic commissioning process. So if we're thinking about you know, the types of services that we need and you know, how we should provide them and what services, what's the best way to deliver these. There's actually a variety of evaluation activities that we can, that we can use essentially throughout this process. And one of the really key things that this has taught us is that evaluation is a really kind of key component throughout the strategic commissioning cycle, if you like, and it's something which we're very keen to, to continue forward as we develop and grow and as new priorities emerge. I don't expect you to read this slide in any great detail. This is simply illustrative to show that from an evaluation perspective, there are really kind of a fork in the road, if you like. So there are some priorities within the Home First um, portfolio, which from an evaluation perspective, we would say we don't actually require to report on these or they require any more evaluate, evaluation work. This is because the concept has been proved, the outcomes have been demonstrated, and these initiatives now run as business as usual. A really good example of this is our hospital at home model in Aberdeen City. It's been comprehensively evaluated previously, We've published some of the findings in international um, research journals, and it's been operating at scale for several years now. So there are examples such as this, which we would feel from an evaluation perspective, they do not require ongoing evaluation support, but rather these can now be monitored at a high level through our performance dashboards. There are, however, some other initiatives, for example, our Stay Well, Stay Connected work stream, which has been refreshed recently, and there may be priorities such as this, which do require ongoing evaluation support. So we think about the reporting moving forward and what this looks like. Operation Home First initially was really born as a, as a, as a, as a portfolio, a short term uh, construct that was really kind of designed to help support us through the winter planning, the winter months. 
as we move forward, as I mentioned, Home First is really now more of an of an ethos rather than a, than a standalone portfolio. And as I mentioned previously, there are a variety of, of priorities within Home First, which are now part of our ongoing business. I believe the committee were presented with um, a, a presentation earlier on about the leadership team objectives and about how underneath each of these objectives there are a raft of activities some of which are those activities within Home First that will continue, that the committee will continue to receive moving forward. And as such, what we would propose is that um, the Home First as a separate entity, the reporting of that would cease and instead those ongoing activities from which were previously part of Operation Home First are now integrated within the leadership team objectives with the new reporting through that structure. So. With that in mind, uh, that is the end of my very brief presentation, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments that the committee might have. You're muted again, John. John. Mute, John. So, uh, is that it? No. OK, that's it. Comes through. Yeah, it's one of those things that you think it's not going to come through. So you click it again and then it's on a, it's on a time warp, I think. OK, thank you very much, Callum. That, that was very helpful. Would you be able to share those slides with us? Because I think uh, to be able to digest them as well with a bit of time would be useful. Um, yeah, absolutely. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Um, Luan. Um, thanks, John. Um, yeah, really helpful to see the update, and I, I think it's really a, the right thing to embed evaluation from the start um, when, when we're doing new initiatives. I suppose for me, the, the, the big question really is, we as an IJB are looking for data that will help us make decisions about what we invest in and what we disinvest in, um, because you know obviously there's a limited um, pool of resources. And, and I think what this evaluation shows is how complex it is to actually have data that will say, yeah, hospital at home, do that, but don't do this. You know, it's it's, it's really, it, it's not given us that, that data at this stage. And I wonder if, um, and this is a very simple idea, but actually should we be thinking about tracking people's journeys through the system so that we capture, you know, when they've used hospital at home, any unintended consequences when they've used near me when they haven't and, and I suppose building a more um a, a more journey kind of focused evaluation um of people's experiences because obviously people just don't use services as a one-off there's an ongoing um you know changes and dips in, in their in their health and well-being so I just wondered Am I being uh, am, am I being realistic in thinking that this gives the complexity but wouldn't give us those answers because of the whole interrelatedness of, of the different services? And is there thinking about looking at a more um more I suppose a more qualitative approach to monitoring journeys um to gather those unintended consequences? That's kind of what's in my mind um at the moment. Um, I, I think what I what I might do is from a from a patient journey perspective, I might in, uh, invite in uh, Duncan because I know there's been some national work previously that has attempted to 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 do this, and he might be able to talk through maybe some of the um, the particular intricacies or challenges that that are involved in that. So Duncan, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, thanks, Callum. Um, so uh, yeah, I have got colleagues, not my myself, that I have got colleagues who have done tried to do this in some other partnership areas. Um, there's a piece of software called Solonis, which is a, a, a pathway, patient pathway mapping or can be used for this particular work. Um, it is very labor intensive. Um, if you think about the number of data sources you're potentially looking, especially if we you wish to go right back to primary care and contacts with primary care onwards. Um, even just looking at secondary care, trying to map pa pathways is quite challenging, um, but it can be done. And you're absolutely right. You know, really what we 
what we want to be looking is is how far upstream could we have identified an alternative route that that patient could have gone down um and i think what this perhaps linking back to the work that we've done you know we we've tried over the course of 6 months to to dive into a uh, whole portfolio range of projects um and and do the best we can but but for many of those projects they simply haven't had the length of time to be able to show the benefits and for there are others there are there is maybe a skills mix that didn't exist in our team that perhaps needs to come in and, and be considered as well particularly i'm thinking around health economics because it's very you know your, your 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 question is absolutely right how do you stop doing something to start doing something else and in a traditional model funding model we, we kind of need to know how do you put a, a pound sign in front of preventative care uh, or self-management it's it's very tricky um and that is something we particularly look at around some of the projects that came under the respiratory priority within um operation home first and going forward but it applies to many chronic conditions and and getting people to look after themselves and, and the spend to save around that aspect as well in terms of actually your immediate question i'm more than happy to uh, speak to some of my colleagues who have more experience in pathway mapping and modeling um, and we could perhaps uh, find something to bring back to the committee um, if that would be of, of help. Um, th thanks, Duncan. That, that's a really, really helpful answer. And I mean, yeah, we would be interested in that. I suppose it's I'm interested in if because I can see that you um, the, take the Operation Home First evaluations and embed them in stuff embed them in, in business as usual but there's a bigger question for us about how we move to pathways of care and how we make sure that we are investing in the right areas so um whether it's coming back to this committee or or or, or it needs a whole system discussion i would I'm, I'm keen to know that that's on the radar and being looked at because i wouldn't want it to be well we've done the evaluation business as usual you know, doesn't answer our fundamental questions we, we we need answered so i suppose it's about how we extract the learning from this piece of work and take it to the next level um, to, to, to get us, um, you know, to maybe to look more at a, at a pathway approach. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and I've got some comments maybe around that, so we'll see if we've got time uh, towards the end, but I'll bring in other people first. Um, I'm now seeing the order of, of hands that went up and I, I brought Luan in quite, quite early there, so I apologise to the others. I've got Councillor Cook. Thanks, John. Um, Luan's question was far more intelligent and sensible than mine, so that's that's absolutely fine. Um, and no, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I actually I, I found the paper really useful, um, and I thought the, the slides were really useful. So I'm glad that we're going to get those circulated. Um, the, um, the one slide in particular that Callum showed was around the the one that was saying we don't need to evaluate this much more on the basis that there's, there's a, a big evidence base and you know there's stuff been published in peer-reviewed journals etc and where that is the case that gives me comfort where it's not the case and further evaluation needs to be done <laughs> that's fine because we need to evaluate some of this stuff because some of this stuff is relatively new so that's good um and and just to comment on the uh, the nasty graph as, as you called it um Normally, when I get something like that in a paper, I roll my eyes and think, why didn't these people explain this in a clearer format? And I was looking at it and looking at it, I'm thinking, actually, it is relatively clear and it's complex because it's complex and there's probably nothing else that you could have done. Um, and actually, it did work. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for your thank you for your comments. And I uh, particularly like your your background. I'll be cheering on the boys tonight. Uh, no, I think the 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 NASA graph, as we call, we call it, I think some I think sometimes sometimes we can shy we can shy away from the from the from the difficult questions and trying to give you know we we sometimes try to give the simple the simple answers and actually I think what we what we did try to do is you know is try to say you know what this is actually this is the reality of the situation this is this is what it this is what it looks like so and um, that's really helpful helpful feedback that that was received um positively so thank you for that okay thank you um councillor dunbar 
Thank you, John. Um, so it's great to hear about embedding evaluation. I think that's really key to a whole, um, you know, way in which we can evidence, um, you know, progress. And I suppose my question, it builds, it maybe builds a bit on Luan's, um, you know, where we're seeing evaluation built in as a key component at the outset. Um, and I'm interested in how it might be used in future, um, or if it, if it is currently being used at all, um, in terms of co-producing services, because it seems to me it's got a key role to help, um, I suppose, um, it's not about, well, it is embedding, but it, but it would be a key role in, in terms of helping to better understand how we might enable co-producing you know, the co-production of services. And I wondered if you could just say a bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'll, 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 I can mention a bit, um, I might invite uh, Alison to come in and, and, and expand on that. But I think a really, probably a really good example of how that's working is in terms of our um, locality plans and our, um, lo our, our locality empowerment groups moving forward. So I guess one of the really um, helpful things uh, about taking that co-production approach is really what we can do is we can show well from our from our I suppose side of the story this is what we know this is what we found and then what that allows us to do I suppose is sense check that with a local group of people to make sure you know is this representative of is this representative of your thoughts is there any ways that we could think about improving this or enhancing this so really what I suppose it allows us to do is it allows us to I suppose validate our thinking, validate what we know on a particular group of people. And it really helps us have, I suppose, that more rounded, more rounded approach and perspective to how we develop and improve services moving forward. So that's kind of one key way that we've been using um, our evidence and findings moving forward to help shape what that looks like. Um, Alison, I don't know if there's anything that you want to come in and, and, and add potentially to that. I, I don't think there's much to add. Um, you know, there, there, there is um, that checking in with um, public, but there's also, um, I guess, uh, checking um, the way we, we we deliver services. So we share the the outcomes from um, with uh, the, the 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 various members of the leadership team, so that they can think about you know how, what does this mean going forward? Do we need to change things? Do we need to um, uh, do something differently? So um, you know there's there's the two aspects. Okay, I suppose maybe um, what I. And it might be a discussion we need to take offline. It, it, I think it was maybe more. I wanted some more detail around. Um, I'm, a, I'm aware of the you know the local empowerment groups work, but it's how um, it's not just about um, you know co-production to me ultimately means about that communities actually are engaged with um, you know how services work um, rather than just you know we do services to people so. I'm not really quite hearing, you know, that we're at that stage yet. And, I, you know, and it's important to me that I think this type of evaluation is, I think, part of how we might get to that. Yeah. So can I can I come, come back in, Leslie? So um, I, I, I think because um, I think when we when we spoke at the last um, CCG meeting, I don't think you had been at the, the previous um, RAP meeting, but um, at that meeting I presented um, I suppose more uh, a more detailed perspective on how we evaluate each of the each of the um, initiatives within Home First. One of the key elements within that is really understanding the experiences of individuals who receive services. So across the piece, across all of the priorities that um, we've implemented, we have done work with service users in some instances we've done work with the significant others whether that's unpaid carers to get a sense of well actually how have they experienced that service what has worked well for them what could be improved moving forward and as i mentioned not just often for the service user but for the support structure around them so whilst that's something which we haven't actually presented in this report 
and um, because this report is sort of more about the totality of it those are um, elements which we had presented in the in the in the previous report to the to the committee so um so yeah sorry i think i just made, i think i slightly um misinterpreted your your question but that is an absolutely uh, pivotal component and that type of data is what we use um as as regular service development i suppose when we're thinking about how we enhance and improve services moving forward okay that um that's fine i um i obviously missed that in the you know i'm not a committee member here and i'd missed it um but thank you for providing that assurance right. Alison, did you want to come back in yeah, just briefly, if that's OK, John, um, thanks. Um, it, it was just to, to say that, you know, again, we, we've mentioned this somewhere, but I can't remember where, um, that we are we're very much on a journey um, with, with, with um, this approach. Um, and it's very difficult to um, sort of go from where we are to that that big bang of of, of having all of our, our communities in, engaged with everything. So we are um, we, what we found with the locality empowerment groups was we had to do a, a quite a bit of preparation with them to get them ready um, to engage and, and, and able to engage in a meaningful way. Um, so whilst absolutely what what you're articulating there, Leslie, is our ultimate ambition. Um, I think we we appreciate we have to sort of do little chunks at a time um, to, to, to get to that final stage. OK, thank you. OK, thank you, Flat. And uh, Councillor Bell. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm looking at page 132 and there's a normal distribution shown on 132. Now, normal distribution is a quantitative statistical tool, isn't it? Um, but you've got on the y-axis number of initiatives plotted against degree of implementation. I'm just wondering what that, you know, what you're actually trying to show there, because of course that's more qualitative. I and mean, I know if something's completed, that's 100 percent. But on, along that completion journey, it's just well, you know, I, I'm guessing it's whatever wherever it is. So what 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 are you actually showing there? Yes, yeah, so so the purpose of it, and and uh, perhaps it's something that I could have uh, explained clearer um, within the report. Uh, it's really more concept conceptual than statistical, and the, the the concept is is that if you have any portfolio such as this, or if you have any piece of work which is comprised of so many moving parts, then what we would typically expect to see is that there are some things which occur down here i.e. there are particular initiatives that are really kind of in their development and they're not delivering any any um, benefits as of yet. There are then ones up at the other side which are actually very, very large scale, have been developed for a very long period of time. But then what we find is that most things are typically in the middle, if you like. So they are delivering some amount of benefits, um, but they are basically sort of on their journey, if you like. So I suppose it's really more of a it's really more of a conceptual um, approach to to emphasize that if you have a broad ranging portfolio such as this, then what we what we can't expect to see is is a lot of things all working at scale across the system, delivering a wide amount of impact because of a variety of competing resources, as we had articulated previously. So it's just another way of, of essentially showing this is what this is the stage of progress and this is what we would expect it to look like. Um, Duncan, I don't know if there's anything you would like to come in and, and, and add from from uh, from your perspective on that. Oh, no, uh, no, I think you've basically summarised it. I, I, I suppose what we were doing, we were using, like you po rightly pointed out, uh, Gazabel, uh, a, a a standard statistical um, common bell curve that most people would recognize but using it in a different way getting people thinking and, and recognizing that there may have been other ways to present that information but what Callum is absolutely what's right you know we had six months of evaluation and in that time there were the vast majority of those projects had done something but not were, were not operating at scale there were only a couple that were really operating at scale there were some who hadn't even really got off the ground particularly and I, I think that was it it was a 
a, not quite. I, wasn't, I was going to use the word fun, but it was a, a just a different way of trying to present that information rather than just simply using a, a form of words to to allay that. But yeah, maybe it doesn't work for you. But that's that, that was the I'm, idea. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a boring engineer. But I'm, it, Fair yeah, enough. It doesn't work for me. That, thank, thank you. Well, I think I think we 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 appreciate we appreciate the feedback. I mean, I think one thing we've been you know we were um, cognizant of is that it's a uh, uh, 25,000 word, 70 page um, re report. And I, one thing we were really keen to do is to try and um, convey information in, in, in different ways. So it's not all, for example, screens of text, but um, having that feedback in terms of what works particularly well, i.e. our nasty graph and maybe what what doesn't work so well, um, I think is helpful information for us as we, you know, refine that and try and convey that in the in the in the most digestible way. So I um, appreciate the feedback. Right, thanks. OK, that's um, everybody who's um, signaled um, for, for questions around this. Um, I think it's it's really helpful to see this and see how it is evolving. Um, as um, Alison has said, it's it's part of a journey. But what, what's I think interesting is we can start to see how it's coming together or, you know, we can start to see um, uh, how it's shaping up. And as I was reading it, I was quite struck because there's always from an academic point of view, complexity and caveats and everything around that, rightly enough, from a leadership and management point of view in the moment, there's a decision needed. So it's it's like how we use this form of evaluation to answer the so what question on the three aims there. You know, at this moment in time, what are we doing um, and, and, and what it looks like? And I, I found this really, really helpful. Um, ever since I've joined the IJB um, and from the NHS point of view, I keep banging on about modeling and being able to see that and even at a very basic level, you know, we've got the three aims. So if we're maintaining people at home or avoiding people going into hospital or early discharge at a very high level, they're just basic numbers. And then the detail comes comes around that. So I think this is very helpful for us as a committee where we're looking at um, uh, performance um, and and risk to start to see how the complexity can align with strategic intent. Um, so my question um, on the back of that is what next? What what will we start to see in, in the future reports that, that you're going to bring to us? Yeah, um, I, I, I wonder if um, I, I suppose aligned to um, some of the conversations which were had previously about the 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 leadership team objectives and priorities moving forward. If um, Alison, if you would you like to come in on on that one? Yeah, thanks, Callan. So, um, as discussed earlier, when we were talking about the leadership team objectives, it's that it's those reports that you will see coming forward um, uh, from from here on in, and we will try and um, highlight within that. Uh, which ones, uh, you know, which of those measures uh, fit into Operation Home First or which fit into the local, uh, local outcome improvement plan or which fit into the uh, strategic plan uh, measures. So um, you'll see uh, that that information, but feeding through the, the leadership team objective dashboard. OK, so just to be clear, will that be at a very basic level? So in terms of are we going from one extreme to the other where we've got a lot of detailed information here, but we're just going to see it in a dashboard in future? Or am I not understanding what you've said correctly? Sorry, there will be a dashboard, but but there will be some contextual information around about what the dashboard is telling you. OK, I'm just going to tease that out a bit further. Right, the contextual information here is a is a large report. Contextual information can be a paragraph. I'm just trying to get a bearings on having opened this up to us and we're getting our bearings on it very well and, and welcoming it. I'm just wondering what happens in terms of the future reporting. Presumably on Operation Home First evaluation, there will be further 
reports on that piece of work and will those come to us so from a so from a from a home first perspective as we mentioned um i saw it suppose one of the limitations about this report is that it is a it is a grampian wide one so i think from from a from a rap perspective there are particular elements um, within this that you would be would be interested in um, those ongoing elements of home first are neatly um, integrated within or sit underneath the leadership team objectives and the priorities within them so it makes sense from a from a i suppose from a board's perspective that they continue to feed in through that mechanism the additional elements of home first that sit out with this will be continued to report into the home first the home first steering group so there will remain a government's route for those elements but those elements which are probably not um uh, of relevance to this committee okay yeah well certainly if that's um, separating out the, the the city issues um and and the wider grampian ones that's that's fine um i think I, what i just don't want to lose is the fact that we're starting to see because some of the questions there i think were really important about um how does this help us in terms of co-production of services or how does it help us um get hold of evaluation across the the whole um strategic intent and i wouldn't want to lose those elements um in terms of the scrutiny because i think they're they're very important and and in in terms of making some shifts that 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 we want to uh, um, keep hold of. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Um, so, OK, well, we'll see that reporting come through um, through Alison's uh, report um, and we can you know, give comment on that uh, once we see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Luan. Yeah, I think I'm similar to yourself, John. I suppose I don't want to lose the, the good experience and the learning that we've got as a result of the way this has been done. Um, and I wonder if it's something about like, so I understand that the specific projects, there'll be a clear reporting route for them and that, that's that's fine. But there's something about just taking the learning from the experience of doing this and making sure that our approach to evaluation is embedded in our strategic planning so that we're we're starting to think in pathways and, and you know, we're taking the learning from home first about the complexity. And you know, so it's something about just the, the wider learning from this experience that we don't lose that and that will be embedded or considered as part of the how we take forward the strategic plan. Um, that would be helpful to have something in um, in the recommendations for me that so that it's not just about the individual projects. It's about what this tells us about what we need to do differently in the future. I don't know if that helps, John. Is that sort of a little bit on the same track as you? Yes, it is. And, and I think um, well, well, we can speak to Derek in a minute just about how we uh, craft that additional recommendation on this. Um, and I, get, I think we're probably still just trying to get our head around what it is we don't want to lose. Yeah. So there's maybe a bit of a conversation offline that that, that can be had with, with Alison on that. Um, so um, can we then at this point go to the recommendation, um, which is um, for the committee to note the information provided in the report. So that's one recommendation, which uh, we're happy to do. The second one, um, Derek, um, Luan's kind of wording there was around um, the learning um, being captured for the strategic planning or future strategic planning. Um, do you have any ideas on, on just how you might uh, draft that? It's about drilling down further, Chair, to be honest, as to what you actually want from this report, a bleak author, uh, and where and when you want it to report. Um, if you're seeking a further um, dare I use the word concise report from Callum on capturing lessons learned, which could assist future strategic planning? Um, well, I think we're, what we're being told is that the reporting from here on will come through the leadership team objectives updates. Um, so maybe we can note that the future reporting will come 
through the reporting on uh, leadership team objectives, but the committee are asking for the learning from the evaluation work to be highlighted in that reporting. Perhaps we can keep it as broad as that and then we can review what, what comes back to us at the next meeting. Does yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll be able to word something along those lines. Would you be looking for something to September on on the learning side from Callum? And then Alison will be producing her future updates as they come. Well, I think it, it'll come through Alison's report. And yeah. just the fact that we've managed it in terms of learning, Alison might say, you know, that's that's not ready for September, but that, you know, if it is fine, if it's not, that, that we're not asking for it at the next cycle necessarily. It's just in the future reports, because Alison's coming forward in the next three cycles, some point in there. Yeah, OK, so we'll leave it with Alison's report in the future and I'll word it around what we've discussed here. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and I'm just noting um, there was, I don't think it needs to go in the minute, but um, noting that with Duncan has come and supported Callum in that, and there was something I think Duncan was going to um, come back on in terms of the pathways, um, and that would be useful from that discussion with, with Luan. Um, could I just mention that because I presume we may not see Callum and, and Duncan as, as frequently as we have done in the last few meetings. Um, so on that basis, can I thank you both? Plus, I know it's a lot wider group that, that's involved in this, but thank you both for your for your contributions. Um, and, and clearly, you're welcome to, to come to the committee again as and, as and when. Um, thank you, and I will pass on your thanks to the rest of the team. OK, thank you very much. Um, so are we happy with that? Uh, as a committee to, to go forward on that basis. OK, sorry, that was a bit uh, a, a bit cumbersome, but there was something there that we needed to, to tease out, I think. OK, can we therefore go to the last item, which is the confirmation of assurance? Um, and just for me to ask you uh, as committee members if you've received adequate assurance from the reports and the discussion um, that's been held today. So that Derek can minute that or, or not. OK, I'm taking silence as yes uh, uh, on that basis then. Um, so that takes us through the um, through the agenda. It's been quite a long meeting, but uh, um, been some important items there. So thank you very much for your contributions um, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, bye folks. Thank you, chat.